All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today on a Wednesday at 11. Um, I'm Amy Clausen with the Niagara on the Lake Museum, and today we're welcoming you to our final lecture of 2021. We made it to the end of the year, so thanks for uh, many of you. I can see your names on the screen there, and uh, many of you have been joining us every other week, so thank you so much for your support over the, the last year with our uh, our first our fall or our um, spring series and then our fall series. Um, today we're recording the lecture, so if for some reason you um, have to jump out, uh, no problem, you'll be sent the link and we'll also put that up on YouTube and you can share it around as well. Um, and today we have with us Rochelle Bush, who's a descendant of African American freedom seekers, and she was born in St. Catharines. She's the proprietor and primary guide of Tubman Tours Canada and is the resident historian of the Salem Chapel BME Church Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Site. Rochelle is also a board member of the Historical Society of St. Catharines, a past board member of the St. Catharines Museum, an honorary member of the Central Ontario Network for Black History, and a Niagara Parks Tourism Guide. Over 25 years ago, Rochelle began to preserve, promote, and protect Niagara's black, rich Black history. This included participating in the development of the early Black history narrative and government tourism initiatives. And Rochelle's also a Niagara College social service uh, worker graduate. Very interesting. So I will turn it over to you, Rochelle, and uh, let's uh, join everyone for the lesser known uncovering some of the Black people of Old Niagara and the surrounding area. Okay, thank you. So let's just make sure I get this right. So I'm hitting new share. Just you can just nod for me. Yeah, you're all good. So new share. And perfect, thank you. So the lesser known, that's an image of um, Niagara on the Lake and it comes from the 1971 book, um, Old Niagara on the Lake by Peter uh, John Stokes. So I wanted to put that image in there just for a period, um, time period or period purposes. So let's see, come on. There we go, I thought it, it, it did freeze. So what this talk is not about, and you can go online and learn more information. So it's not about the African enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, institutionalized slavery and or chattel slavery in Canada or the United States. And it's really not about the Underground Railroad. So I got a couple of disclaimers to add. So the talk includes some of my genealogy. So if you read the media releases, um, one of them indicated that um, I did a DNA test, which I did do, and I got the results back last September, September 2020, and I now have a serious addiction. So it's trying to find these shared matches that I had no idea were extended members of my family. So it's tracing them. So through all of this, um, this talk is about one of them that I have been able to trace. Also, for time period and visual, visual presentation purposes, unless otherwise stated images of the unidentified people are from the Brock University collection, uh, the Rick Bell family archives. So there's two of them there now. So they're unidentified and they are either St. Catherine's residents um, or from other parts of Niagara or Ontario. So when I was invited uh, for the, when I was asked to do the talk, um, it was originally gonna be called Discovering the Graves of Niagara. I should have stuck with that, but it was uh, me that changed my mind as I often do, um, but that should have been the original title and you'll find out why. So it centers around a family who was Watson Graves. So Watson Graves appears in the 1851 uh, Niagara census. So it's the census that's Canada West and Canada East. So you'll see where the arrows are, where they indicate that there's Watson Graves. He's from the United States. He's 41 years old. And I'm looking at the bottom, of course. And then his wife, Rachel Graves. And her name is Rachel Matthew Graves. So her maiden name was Matthews. I'm not tracing Rachel today. I will, um, oh, I'm not gonna discuss her. I'll save that for another talk perhaps. So what I'm doing right now is just going through the male genealogy lines and how they eventually connected with me. So there's Watson Graves and some of his children. This is the 1861 census. They're still living in Niagara and they have a total of 10 children born in Niagara or as we know it today, Niagara on the Lake. 
And you can see the top yellow arrow where it's indicating Niagara on the lake. And if I just back up one, that 1851 census, it doesn't state Niagara on the lake on it. But what I want to point out in this one again is look at their oldest son's age. So Abraham Richard Graves is 12 years old in 1851. So again, back to 1861, you will see the family listed there again. And this is to identify where they both came from. So Watson Graves came from North Carolina. His wife, Rachel, came from Virginia. So obviously they met in Upper Canada and their first child, Abraham Richard, was born in Upper Canada. So again, the 1851 census and the names, the family member names. So Watson Graves, Rachel, Abraham, John Graves, Mary, George, Sarah, and Benjamin. And then in 1861, we also, their additions are Grace, Margaret, and Isabella. So now we're at the 1849 assessment rule, which places Watson Graves in Niagara or Niagara on the Lake. So what you'll see here is Watson Graves um, living in a community where there's Daniel Waters, as well as William Waters. Now, some of the other people that I started to trace, and, and well, I have done that, but for time constraints, I excluded them from this talk. So Alfred Wares, or Wars, he moves around the Niagara Peninsula, as well as the Graves family. And his brother, Lloyd, it's spelt here L-O-Y-D, he drops off. And then Lewis Thompson or Levi Thompson, I really didn't trace him. So I didn't put a lot of effort into him. But what I'm pointing out here is that William Watson Graves is living in the Niagara on the Lake community. And of course he knows Daniel Waters as well as William Waters. And they were the prominent black family at the time in Niagara on the Lake for those that do not know about them. So in 1864, Watson Graves is still on the assessment roll for Niagara on the Lake. And the arrow indicates their um, value of $12 is the tax that he paid. And then of course, when we're look, talking about the settlement of Niagara on the Lake, to my knowledge, the first time it was documented and mapped out was in um, 1993 when um, they were commemorating the bicentennial. So this of course is one of the gemstones of black history, not only in Niagara on the Lake, but as well as Niagara. So From Slavery and Freedom in Niagara, written by Michael Powell and Nancy Butler. So that's the map of the black settlement in Niagara on the Lake. And then of course, most recently, Niagara on the Lake. Um, I don't know what to say other than hands down, without question, they've done it. Um, they super seated all other parts of the peninsula with their Black History walking tour. If you haven't done the walking tour yet, it's phenomenal. I plug it as a tour operator to, for tourism as well as to clients who are taking the tour. So you'll see in uh, the center column, Daniel Waters and the Slave Cottage. Now, of course, there's additional notations that you can read about with regards to Daniel Waters because um, I guess, and I don't know this to be true, but they're questioning now why local residents were calling it a slave cottage when Daniel Waters was in fact a uh, freeborn. And number 10 is the, where the Daniel Waters cottage is and that's the walking tour for Niagara on the lake. So this is the vicinity where Watson Gla excuse me, Graves lived and the people that he mingled with, some of them. The 1871 census now places Watson Graves in St. Catharines. So, in 1861, shortly thereafter, his namesake, William Watson Graves, was born. So he would be not necessarily William Watson Graves Jr., because Watson Graves was just simply Watson Graves. That's as far as we know him to be. So he added an additional name, which is the first name, William. So you can see that William Watson Graves was born in Niagara on the Lake, and then his sister, Florence Graves, who was only six months old in 1871 was born in St. Catharines. You'll see the top arrow again indicating St. Catharines. 1881 census now places the family in Welland. Well, it's just William and Rachel, and that's because um, there was a large settlement of the um, black community 
in Welland as well. So they moved around the peninsula. Watson Graves, who was born in North Carolina and made his way to Niagara on the Lake, died in 1883 in St. Catharines. Um, there's the death notice there, and there's an image of Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So that's where he is buried. From his children, we have Florence Graves, the youngest child that I just mentioned. So she marries James Davis in 1897, and their daughter is Norvell Johnson. So some of you are probably familiar with her name. So she is the lady that the late Wilma Morrison named the Black History Library after. I'm stuttering because to me, it's still astonishing and it's shocking for me not to know before my DNA results that I was related to Norvell Johnson. How amazing is that? So you'll see where the yellow arrow is that Florence Graves um, is indicated on her marriage record. Isabel Veneta Graves. So she's another child of Watson Graves as well as Rachel Matthews. So Isabella married Richard Hutchinson. Richard Hutchinson is the son of Mary and William Hutchinson. They both were members of the Fugitive Aid Society that Harriet Tubman established when she was in St. Catharines. So that society was established around 1861. So his parents were famous and both Mary and William are buried out in Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So something that I haven't said in the past that I'll put it out there now, Richard Hutchinson was also um, the individual named in the Hutchinson versus the St. Catherine School Board. And that took place in 1871. So it was William Hutchinson, again, who was the treasurer of the Fugitive Aid Society that Harriet Tubman established. He wanted to fight, well, he did fight. He sued the St. Catherine School Board because of segregation. So he wanted his son, Richard, to be um, included in a school with all white students where he could get a higher education. So he wanted him to receive the formal education rather than the C grade or D grade um, education that students were receiving in the colored schools. So Richard Hutchinson himself was famous. And of course, Bella Graves would have known him at the time. Uh, they were living in St. Catharines when this happened. And then she actually grew, grew up to marry him. And I think that's a fantastic story. So from St. Catharines, they moved on to Lockport, New York. And that's where I thought my family ties connected with them because I do have um, a great uncle who moved on to Lockport, New York. Um, but that's not where the family connection comes in. Afterwards, after Richard died, Bella eventually moved on to Rochester, New York with one of her kids. So William Watson Graves the first. So William Watson Graves again and Rachel Matthews um, had their son, William Watson Graves. And this is him in the 19, him and his family in the 1911 census in St. Catharines. So you'll see that he has a few of his children listed. Um, they had eight children in total. So he married Lucy Jones and she was also a resident of St. Catharines. William Watson Graves died in 1928 uh, in St. Catharines. And he's also buried at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So this is uh, the 1921 census with William Watson Graves. Again, eight children, and you'll see where it's indicated, uh, the line, so where Watson Graves' name is, as well as a few of his children. So with the, with the libraries, as it is common now, there's the local history index. So what I did is I just Googled his, well, through the system, I researched his obituary and you can see that he was um, buried at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. But what's important about him, he was just, um, I'll say a, a common laborer. He was, a member of the BME church, so identified as Methodist, but he helped reestablish St. Luke's Lodge, which was Prince Hall Freemasonry here in St. Catharines. So in his father's time here in St. Catharines, it was Victoria Lodge. 
Um, and it was founded in 1852. And then it kind of petered out 1880s. And then it um, was reestablished again as um, St. Luke's Lodge. William Watson Graves, I'll say William Watson Graves number two, or he is number one, um, helped establish that. So that's, that's um, as much as I want to say there. And then you'll see that we have his death notice, what's important that I want everybody to notice. And I didn't indicate it, so I'm just circling it now. So when he passed on, he was in living on Mildred Street. So I hope you can see it right there. So it's indicated at the bottom as well. So William Watson Graves had a son named William Watson Graves. So he's actually number two or junior, but the nickname was Waddy Graves. So that's what everybody called him. The community called him Waddy Graves. So he was born in 1905 in St. Catharines and he married uh, Gladys Isabel Henderson. And in the area where he lived in St. Catharines, it was called Orchard Park because as we know, it was districts, but it, he lived on Mildred Avenue. So you'll see where the arrow is, that it's Mildred Avenue. So that's Watson Graves, as well as his wife, Gladys. This is the house that he built. So Watson Graves was very industrious. His father had already had land on Mildred Avenue, so in Orchard Park. He inherited that land, and this is what he built on that property. So it's one of the distinctive homes in St. Catharines, little Spanish villa. So you can see in the bottom right-hand corner that fence that goes all the way around the property. So he built the home and then he eventually sold it to Fred Dorsey, another prominent family name here in uh, the Niagara region, um, especially St. Catharines, as well as throughout the GTA. After he sold the home to Fred Dorsey, Watson Grave moved around the corner just to number 70 Marjorie Avenue. So with genealogy, we know that enslavement denied people of African descent their ancestry. In the New Yorker, they had a great article in September. It was about unearthing black history and it related to cemeteries. But this is the quote that I pulled from it. So for reasons that have everything to do with the atrocities of slavery, which stole people from their homes, separated children and parents, barred marriage and assigned to people no family name except that of the one who claimed to own them, it is extremely difficult for descendants of the enslaved to trace their ancestry. And we know this when we watch Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. With my African ancestry, I can go back to 1830. That's uh, pretty much as far as I can go right now. I don't know if I'll ever be able to go back further. With my white ancestry, because I'm Black North American, and we know that miscegenation occurred, um, but I do have one white ancestor from Haldeman County who we always thought was Irish, but she turns out to be English. That was um, a marriage of love, now, nothing to do with miscegenation. Um, for With my white ancestry, through the DNA and shared matches, I did reach 1721, but now I'm back into the 1600s. But it's not an ancestry that I'm going to identify with or shake hands with anybody or, you know, reach out and say, hey, this is my ancestry because I don't identify as white. I identify as black and in particular, black North American or African North American. African North Americans or again, black North Americans, when you look at uh, or listen to Henry Louis Gates, we're admixtures. We all know that. Um, and there, in this article, there's another quote. Um, about Henry Louis Gates. So Henry Louis Gates, although he is of a lighter complexion, he is black North American 100%. But when he's communicating with friends, and one example would be Barack Obama, Barack Obama, who we do know is half white, has a higher percentage of black than Henry Louis Gates. So who was Watson Graves? North Carolina runaway notices. So remember, it's difficult for us to trace. So now it comes to speculation, we got a guess. Tracing the slave masters. So John Graves, did Watson Graves take his name 
from one of his enslavers. Is this guy one of his enslavers? So it was a $20 reward for a young man by the name of Solomon, who was 20 years old at the time. So Watson Graves' birth year range is from 1795 to 1804. So we don't know, but he fits in that category or that area. It's the right time. Then there's another one. So March 1st, 1837. Again, the name Graves. Did he use part of that name? So this is a slaveholder or an enslaver, Graves Bonneville. So again, it fits in the right time period. He's 27 years old. And this of course took place in 1837. And then a year later, Granville, um, Graves Bonneville is still searching for Bob, his runaway. And he placed another ad in uh, the newspaper. So here's the list of the North Carolina enslavers. So you'll see second from the top, John Graves. And there's four, well, three with the name John Graves and then in another one, John Greaves. 28 enslaved people. But because the records don't uh, identify who was male and who was female, we'll never know. So there's one John Graves. He enslaved five people. Second John Graves that I just mentioned, 28 people. And then the third one, five enslaved people. And they're all from the US uh, federal census, as you note, um, from 1800. Now, Watson Graves the second or junior. As I mentioned, we referred to him as Waddy Graves. So he built that house on Mildred Avenue. He was very industrious. Um, again, common labor because you couldn't always get the job that you wanted uh, and you couldn't advance because you were held back. We know this, like I'm, we, we know it. So he was able to build this house in St. Catharines and then he sold it. So it's on Mildred Avenue. This identifies my father's home, the property he owned in St. Catharines on Mildred Avenue. So it's the 1968 voters list and it was online uh, because there's a community group. When you go on Ancestry, if you um, have Ancestry at home or you use it at the library, you'll see that you can go through the public uh, members trees to find additional information. And I have been doing that and I have been communicating with people um, with regards to this genealogy connection. Uh, and so far in this one singular group, there's 168 people who just discuss Watson Graves, the original from North Carolina. I was shocked and dumbfounded when I found that out. But this voters list shows you um, where my family lived. So my father bought property on Mildred Avenue in 1942, 1942-43, number 57, around the same time that Watson Graves was building the house. So they knew each other. At no time did they know that they were relatives. Never came up in my household. So every day, this home that we called the Castle House, I would see all the time. Was able to talk to this man, met him many times, had no idea he was a relative. My father never indicated that. And that's because the branches were so far spread out that nobody knew. And I've found that uh, this has happened quite a bit with many of the local black families. So again, there's from the 1968 voters list. And that is my connection to Niagara on the Lake. So you'll see all the dots that I'm connected to in the Niagara area. It's just amazing and uh, I'm floored by it all. So I try not to take the black genealogy and make it sell about self, um, but it is, it's still Niagara history and I'm proud to be able to claim some of it. This is where my roots begin in Niagara on the Lake. So the Graves family, although they moved around quite a bit and they were shadow people, so they weren't of great prominence like the Waters family, 
Um, but they were here. They were in Niagara on the lake and they were here for a very long time in Niagara. Some of course moved over to uh, the United States. Others moved to various parts of Ontario. And one branch of the Graves family tree actually moved to Quebec. So they settled in Montreal. For me to make that connection with the Hutchinson's family is unbelievable, phenomenal. How it all comes through and again, for me, genealogy is now an addiction. I thought for sure, like I mentioned earlier, that it was going to come through the connection of Lockport, New York. It did not. In my father's genealogy, and it's always been difficult tracing the females, my great grandmother is named May Washington. That's how they're connected. So when you're doing it, your genealogy, we all know that you have to go through the third cousins, and that's where you'll actually make that connection. It's time consuming, but that's how I eventually made the connection to the Graves family and Niagara on the Lake. That's a wrap. With special thanks to the staff at Niagara on the Lake Museum for inviting me to participate in the 2021 virtual lecture series. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. You can follow me on Tubman Tours Canada if you like. It's a tourism page, but I share a lot of the local history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rochelle. It's interesting to um, for us too to be at, be able to add the Graves name to some of our Niagara Lake files now too, because I don't know if that's one we have um, much information about, and it could be something we could add to the Voices of Freedom um, walking tour uh, app as well in the future. Um, so hmm. that's really great. I wanted to know if you and if other people have questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q and A in the chat box. Um, do you know why people left Niagara on the Lake and went to other parts of the of the Niagara region? Was it for work? Um, uh, you know, your family moved around quite a bit through the region. So do you know why they were moving? Okay, don't hate me. <laughs> Just a guess. Too many Confederates put down roots. You know, and you know, yeah, I love the Confederate story. I tell that story. I've had people tell, ask me, why do you tell that story? I don't care what anybody says. It happened in the historical past. It is a thrilling, a th thrilling story. Like I could go on for hours about it, but I'm talking about it from 2021. I'm not dealing with the people who were actually, you know, here um, who put down roots, who were serving in the civil war. So different time period. I can understand their perspective. And in St. Catharines as well, Confederates were here. So I can't say that it was as comfortable for everybody. We, we always guess. talk about that and wonder what it must have been like during that time to have uh, these Confederate, Confederate uh, soldiers seek refuge here at the same time that- um, Oh yeah. You know, it's- That's, it's that's number one. Yeah. Number two, Amy, you ready? And again, don't hate me. I'm ready. <laughs> Don't hate me. Everybody was pretty much already multiracial when they did arrive. So when you're looking at the Servos Waters family, those children are biracial. Because if you go back to the 1849 assessment role that I put up, they identify four men as colored men, but they don't do that to Daniel or William Waters. So they were men of prominence. So why would they do that? So their children, if they married white people, they're white now and eventually white. So I have so many branches of my family tree. Um, that are white. When I first did my DNA, I was quite shocked. I, I was in tears thinking, who are all these white people? Well, that's what happened. That's the free country we live in. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm not going to lie. It took me three days to figure it out. It's like, everybody's turned white. Could do a book on that. Absolutely. Um, Gail Kerr wanted to know what you meant by the third cousin connection for tracing your ancestors. Oh, they say, and this is just through uh, my research, when you're having difficulty trying to find somebody, look at the shared matches um, for third cousins and then start going through their trees if they have available trees. So some people call them pass-throughs or through lines and see if anything connects there. And that's what I had to do, process of elimination. I actually went through third cousins, went into their trees that were available. And then on the far right side of Ancestry, when you click on it, it says list all the names. And I start putting in 
all the names, my eight great grandparents and the 16 great grandparents, where are you? And that's how I eventually found Washington. It was like, oh my God. But I had to wait for it to connect on three different, t- uh, three different trees or three different people. Otherwise, I mean, if it was one person, that's not saying anything. Yeah. And how far back again did you say you were able to go on uh, through your Black heritage? 1830. Oh, that's great. But you have you have no clue if you'll be able to go any further, I guess, at this point, right? Because as you said, it's, not, it's no, all speculation. No. I, I thought it was very interesting, the one, um, the one Graves uh, slave ad, it said that he had... I think it said it had six toes on each foot or something. Yeah. And I thought yeah, that would yeah. be, that would be like, <laughs> that's such like a specific thing that if you found anything that said that your family member had six toes, that would really be helpful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But nobody's identified that yet. So I must say 1830 here in Canada. So old roots here in Canada, um, in the United States, free blacks. I can go back to when my two times great grandfather was born. That was 1812 no enslaved people beyond uh, 1830 or it's difficult to trace. Well, I shouldn't say that just it's dawning on me now, James Pleasant Bush. So he was born in Virginia in 1795. And then he made his way to Oro and he was here in 1830. So again, 1830. Um, So Isabel says, welcome to the genealogy rabbit hole, Rochelle. (laughs) Terrific research. (laughs) especially the Hutchinson link, a real historic marker. Uh, So here's her question. Have you had any photographic images turn up of your newly discovered family members? That would be the ultimate treasure to see faces. Nothing, Isabel. And thanks. Thank you. Thank all of you for the questions. Nothing. I wish. Um, I do have another collection of negatives that I want to go through, but they're pretty much my Canfield roots, Haldeman County. Uh, So they belong to my grandmother, but, um, and it's a different branch of the family tree. So it would be Harper flowers, but I still have to go through them. I don't think I will find uh, anything old, you know, maybe 1920s, 30s, but that it would be a find if I could for sure. All right, so I think that's it for the questions. So I think we can end there. And thank you again, Rochelle, for sharing that with us. It's always interesting um, finding out all of these genealogical roots through the Niagara region, and especially here to Niagara-on-the-Lake. Um, if uh, if people want to, um, contact information for Rochelle, if you have questions about any of this research, or you're trying to research your your own families, um, just reach out to us and we can get you in touch with Rochelle. Um, Or you can also uh, Google Tubman Tours and you can get in touch with her that way as well. So thank you so much, Rochelle. So this is the final lecture lecture for us and we'll be back uh, in the winter with some more talks. So just stay tuned for that. We'll announce those in January. Um, again, if anybody wants to support our lecture series, I've put a link in, um, in the chat as well. Um, we always accept donations for these free programs. Um, and also we just put out uh, a little mini documentary um, about Black history in Niagara that Rochelle was a part of as well. Um, so you can check for that on our Facebook page um, and on, on our YouTube page, on our website all over the place. Oh, I have one more quick question if you don't mind, Rochelle. <laughs> um, Stuart Hall is asking, when did the first Africans arrive in Niagara? Well, that would be, to my knowledge, um, documented pure point 1780, but then, um, oh, who's the gentleman? Hamilton, uh, who was working for the British. He was uh, like a merchant. He was running around. I just remember the quote, him and his two Negroes. So that's around. I'm going to say 1768. So yeah, yeah. But I don't hang on to that because that's not the time period that I'm dealing with, but I do have the documentation. So peer point for sure, loyalist, black loyalist, 1780, first one documented, but earlier than that. Great. And then there's another gentleman, it just dawned on me. Someone who was, uh, uh, what is his name? It escaped me was living by the river, squatter's rights. Um, Green, Green, his name's coming to me. Um, Again, around the same time period, 1768, 1770. Wonderful. 
All right, so thank you very much. Again, everyone, thanks for joining us and uh, keep in touch over the holidays and stay tuned for more lectures in the new year. Thank you so much. Thank you.